we sit down to meditate, settle down with the breath, your mind becomes very sensitive. And sometimes things you did in the past that you don't feel right about will come up, and they hurt. And it's all too easy to start feeling remorse. Remorse is not a, an attitude or a feeling that the Buddha recommended, because as he noticed, it weakens you. We sometimes feel remorse for one of two reasons. One is that there's a childish belief that if you feel bad enough about having done something, then the punishment will be mitigated. Another, of course, is the feeling that if you don't feel badly about something, you'll probably repeat the mistake again. In the first case, feeling bad about it is not going to make any difference. Noticing that it was a mistake and resolving not to repeat it, that's all that can be expected of a human being. And for the fear that we've got some suffering awaiting us in the future as a kind of punishment. The Buddha recommends that to not suffer from the results of past bad actions or past unskillful actions, that you develop the Brahma-viharas, and particularly equanimity, and the ability to be not overcome by pain, which, and not to become overcome by pleasure. Because the two go together. You get overcome by pleasure, and then you hold on to the pleasure, and it, it's like catching a fish. You discover you have this huge fish that's going to dive way down into the ocean and pull you down. So it may leap up, and you say, ah, oh, this is pleasure, but then it dives down to the ocean, it'll pull you down. So if the mind is overcome either by pleasure or pain, there's going to be suffering. But as for the question as to whether you deserve to suffer or not, it's interesting. The Buddha never talks about people deserving to suffer. He simply says certain actions lead to certain results. But he's here to cure our problem of suffering, whether it's deserved or not. That point should be underlined many, many times. The teaching on karma is not to explain or to justify meeting out horrible things that happen to people. It's supposed to be used to explain how you can find a way out, so that whatever you did in the past, there's a way out for you. Think of Angulimala, he killed a thousand people, or 999, and that he was able to become an arahant. So the question of fearing deserved suffering. The Buddha is not here to tell you that you deserve to suffer. He's here to say, this is the way you act skillfully so that you don't have to suffer. And if you've done unskillful things in the past, note the fact, note that it was a mistake, resolve not to repeat it, and then develop the Brahma Viharas. Goodwill for yourself, goodwill for others, everybody. Compassion for yourself, compassion for others, empathetic joy for yourself, empathetic joy for others, equanimity for yourself, equanimity for others. But he also says you have to develop discernment, because sometimes we can do very unskillful things based on what we think is the compassionate thing to do. You can't simply trust your mind to say, or your heart to tell you what to do in a situation. Say, so, well, just there's a lot of love and that'll take care of it. We can do some awfully unskillful things based on love. So what is the proper motivation to make sure you don't repeat a mistake? Well, the Buddha says there are two things. One is heedfulness, and the other is sangwega. Heedfulness is simply realizing that whatever you do will come back one way or another. And so you want to be very, very careful about what you do. And sangwega is that attitude that looks at life as a whole, and sees how scary it is. That's one of the meanings of the word sanguega. The other meaning is dismay. 
You think how it is that we are born again and again and again. We all want happiness, and we can do some really unskillful things based on our desire for happiness. We find people that we love, we can do unskillful things based on our love. In other words, as long as we're living under the power of delusion, then no matter how good things get, there's always an underside. There's always a possibility that everything will fall apart. No matter how much we understand about the Dharma, there are times we forget. All this is motivation to get out of the cycle, because that is the most skillful course. Some people say it's selfish that you're just pulling yourself out, but think about what samsara means. Samsara is not a place, it's an activity, it's something we do. We keep wandering on. We get this body and we wander through life with this body, then we can't use this body anymore. The mind goes wandering off to find something else. And it's driven by craving and driven by clinging. And you know what the mind is like when it's driven by craving and clinging, especially when it's being pushed out of something where it's used to being. It's going to find something new and it just grabs onto anything. It's like being pushed out of your house. You'll take the first house that appears on the market. And so this is an activity, and, and we actually create our worlds of, of becoming through the activity of wandering on, through, through craving. So it's like an addiction. And so the best thing to do with an addiction is to learn how to end it. And you'll benefit, the people around you will benefit too. Because as we're creating our individual worlds, we all have to feed, and we're feeding off of many times the same food sources. There's competition. So simply pulling yourself out of the out of the cycle really helps to at least to take one mouth out of the feeding cycle. And you're setting a good example because the things we do in order to, to get out are not just running away. We're generous. We have to be virtuous. We try to develop good qualities. And one of the motivations for doing this is, is compassion. As the Buddha said, the people who help us, if we really do get out, then they benefit greatly. So it's important that you realize, no matter, no matter how good things get, no matter how much you've learned about things. If you haven't reached any of the noble attainments, there's always a possibility of backsliding. That's what's scary. That's what's terrifying about all this. So the proper response when you've realized that you've made a mistake, you've harmed somebody, is not remorse. It's heedfulness and sangwega. And it's interesting in the Buddha's analysis that deals both with that attitude that if I, if you feel enough remorse, you'll make up for the, the mistake. Or if you feel remorse, that you will prevent yourself from repeating it. His antidotes for remorse in both cases are the Brahma Viharas, the attitude of limitless goodwill, compassion, empathetic joy equanimity. But he also requires discernment, because as I said, compassion can sometimes be misleading. That's where compassion gets scary. This is why discernment is so important. What does it come down to? In understanding the principles of what is skillful and what is unskillful. The Buddha gives some basic examples or the precepts, but then there are the more subtle things, and for that it requires a lot of discernment, a lot of mindfulness, a lot of alertness, to see how the mind can lie to itself about what's skillful and what's not, and to learn how to get past that. This is why we meditate, to strengthen our powers of mindfulness, to strengthen our powers of alertness. so we can see what we're doing and what's actually coming about as the result of our actions, and then remembering that. 
Again, you don't have to use remorse in order to pound it into the mind that something was a mistake. Heedfulness and sangwega are enough. So basically what the Buddha is doing is having us react to our mistakes as adults. Because one of the things you've learned as an adult is that mistakes are very easy to make. But you can learn from them. And that's the important thing, is learning from them. And having the right balanced and mature attitude of how not to repeat the mistake without having to beat yourself up over your past mistakes. And to prepare yourself, okay, you, you know that you've got some past mistakes. There's going to be some pain coming in the future. This shouldn't be news. So you develop the qualities of mind so that pain and pleasure don't overcome the mind. In other words, you develop concentration, you develop discernment. Because having concentration as an alternative to sensual pain and pleasure puts you in a safe place. So when pains come, you have an alternative place to go so they don't have to drive you around. And as you've learned, getting the mind to settle down. If when you're working with the breath there's a sense of ease, if you leave the breath with a sense of ease and everything falls apart, blurs out, you get into what's called delusion concentration, where things are very nice and very still, but you don't really know where you are. And you come out and you're not really sure whether you are asleep or awake. That's not the path. So you have to learn that even though there's pleasure coming up as you're working with the breath, you can still stay with the breath. You don't get waylaid by the pleasure. So getting the mind into concentration helps you overcome your attachment to sensual pleasures and also helps you not be overwhelmed by the sense of pleasure that comes from just simply getting the mind to settle down and be still. Now this, of course, includes discernment, because that's ultimately what's going to free you from pleasure and pain. And notice the Buddha's discernment works whether the pleasures or pains are deserved or not. You realize that you've had enough of that back and forth. You want to go to something better. And so you can pull the mind out of both pleasure and pain. You see the mind, you see your awareness as something separate. This is one of the skills you develop as you meditate, and this is a really important skill. I guess as that chant said just now, we're all subject to aging, illness, and death. We have these things lying in wait, and we want to be ready for them. As someone once said, the most amazing thing about human beings is everybody knows they're going to die, but they all act as if they don't know. Well, you know. Act as if you can take that to heart. You can prepare. You can get the mind ready for times when there will be aging and illness and death. And you don't have to suffer from them, because you've learned how to separate the concern for pleasure and pain and the pleasure and pains themselves and your awareness. You make these separate into three separate things. And then the pleasure itself and the concerns, they don't have to weigh the mind down. They're there, but they're not having an impact on the mind. That's when you're really safe. So you get to that safe place, not through remorse, but through heedfulness and a sense of sangwega. Those are two emotions that you can really rely on. Of course, you don't want to just sit in sangwega. You want it to propel you to, to act. As with that chant just now, with aging, illness, death, separation, that's all about sangwega. And the reflection on karma, that's actually basada, confidence that there's a way out. It's through your actions that you can find the way out. Always keep that in mind. Things don't end with sangwega. They move on to basada, confidence.
So meditate with confidence. Think of your past mistakes with confidence that you're not going to have to repeat them. Because you're the type of person who learns.